love coming to a nice place and have a beverage and have people clap for me. I like it. I'm Shannon Moore, this is More Up North, and uh, welcome back to our panel. I'm thrilled to have back. He's a marine conservationist and sustainability consultant. Who sounds fancy. <laughs> Anytime and anywhere there's an oil spill from the Exxon Valdez to the Eastern Mediterranean to the Gulf of Mexico, they call the professor. Please welcome back my good friend Rick Steiner. <laughs> Thank you. Good to be here. I know. Sorry, we're not MSNBC. We didn't uh, know, but, but it's than. nice that you like come back down to the, to the little folks. Absolutely. Uh, she's an engineer and the Arctic Program Director to the Wilderness Society. She served on numerous federal advisory committees and recently advised the Department of the Interior on a safety report to the President, that would be Obama, uh, following BP's Gulf spill. Say hello to Lois Epstein. Nice to see you. And uh, he's an international diplomat to the Arctic Council and President of the Prince William Sound Citizens Advisory Council. Please welcome Walt Parker. And a treasure. Okay, so uh, so much going on now. Just we're filming this obviously on Thursday night, but there's news now that there's another uh, spill happening in Alaska. We've been you've been dealing with them. You've been deal, you've been advising the president on them. How about this, dear Mr. President? Make them stop spilling oil. Um, <laughs> I mean, th this is an issue that's going on for a long time. Is it possible, I just want to get this question out of the way, is it possible for us to be developing oil and not be spilling it? It's possible if you do it right to not spill as much. But, uh, you know, a perfect system uh, doesn't exist anywhere. So, but we spill more, far more than we should. Because, because I, go ahead. Because, uh, you know, people save money on maintenance, they save money on training. They don't replace systems fast enough, but mainly they don't train enough, and they don't buy the right kind of materials to keep oil from spilling. So it's, t in, in, to your mind, most of it's avoidable? Yeah. And I'd agree. You would? Yeah, it's a, it's a dirty, complicated industry, and there's some things that are unpredictable, but if you spend enough money, and you uh, do what you need to do, because we know how to keep oil in pipelines, but you have to do it on an ongoing basis and you can't be complacent, and uh, we could dramatically reduce the amount that's spilled, absolutely. The, I, I certainly agree with that. We can reduce the risk. However, you can never get to zero risk as long as we're using this stuff, which we're going to be doing for the next 10 or 20 or possibly 30 years, we're going to be spilling it, period. There is always going to be human error, no matter how careful we are. There is always going to be mechanical and equipment failure, no matter how well designed these systems are. Look at the space shuttle program, most thoroughly engineered system we've ever built, and there have been two catastrophic failures within 135 launches. After the first one, the Challenger, they thought they really figured that out and got it straight and worked it out. But what they didn't anticipate were the problems that brought down the Columbia. So no matter how careful we are, there's going to be catastrophic spills, which brings up the question then of the Arctic and what we do there. So. Right. I have one other thing to add, which was that I was on a panel after the BP spill, uh, the former Minerals Management Service had. We talked about Challenger in Columbia. There was a woman professor from MIT, and she said, you know, they're not doing great in terms of safety either, uh, but if you look at Boeing and aviation, they knew their whole uh, livelihood would go away if they had a record of planes falling out of the air, so they made lots of improvements. She said this industry, the oil and gas industry, has a very high threshold for risk. They're comfortable, the employees are comfortable knowing that there are going to be problems, um, they, they get high pay, and uh, they know there's high risk in terms of safety. And, you know, that's across the industry for the most part, with a little bit of differences in the, in the different companies, in their cultures. Right. I, I've definitely heard that from people in the industry, that some, some companies have a very different culture and tolerance level, BP being one of the ones that seem to be an outlier Probably. that yeah. are willing to mm -hmm. take a lot more risk than, than some of the others. You know, I, I sort of look at it as, you know, we're not going to have an abstinence-only policy with oil extraction. 
You know, not right. I'm not getting on a plane with a solar panel. I have made this statement. If anybody ever sees me on one with a solar panel, I'm really medicated. But you might get on one with biofuels. So. Uh, we'll talk. I'll, uh, I will definitely get on one using lots of yeah. other chemistry yeah. to make sure I'm fine. But I mean, you know, this absence only absence only doesn't work uh, right now for development or other areas, and you know. Occasionally people get pregnant, but you hope that they're using the precautions, right? Yeah. And that you can clean up and afford whatever's coming down the pike. And that doesn't seem to be really the, the full thought through. I want to ask you guys, right now, uh, we really have been under this drill baby drill, and that Alaska needs to be drilled hard and hot because we are tired of buying oil from our enemies, Canada and Mexico. <laughs> um, which are the ones that we buy the most from. Everyone's like, we're buying phones. from people that don't like us. And yeah. I'm like, really? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm not getting that how much Canada and Mexico no. hate us. But, but right now, th there's this real push that Alaska is the answer to like freedom of right. security. Of energy independence. Energy and independence yeah, and, yeah. And, and that. What do you think of that? Well, I signed off on the Alaska pipeline, and I signed off on a 20-year pipeline. Now it's a almost 40-year pipeline, and signed off on by the Bush administration, Bush 43, for another 25 years. They, uh, you know, I uh, don't uh, think that there's uh, any particular comparisons here. But I grew up with FAA and with NASA, and. Uh, we had very different culture and very different attitudes. In fact, the attitudes are better then than they are now. Mm -hmm. There's uh, ever since uh, Reagan came along and said we didn't need any government, why the FAA has gotten weaker in its enforcement, and I think NASA's gotten weaker too. Although I haven't had that much to do with NASA in recent years, it's uh. You know, you get what you pay for. And uh, we got 25 billion barrels of oil out there in the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas. And they want it without paying for it. If they want it, they should be willing to pay for systems that we have some assurance they will be safe. I think the systems that are in place right now are abominable. And that's mainly the fault of the federal government for not enforcing them, following up on Reagan and the Bushes, uh, idea that, you know, let's let the industry do as it pleases, and we'll Right, the along. invisible hand of the free market. You betcha. Yeah, this, we'll see how that invisible hand slaps you upside the head if it still feels invisible. Yeah, and, and Shannon, to respond directly to your question, the, it's actually intellectually dishonest to talk about getting rid of foreign oil. Right. Um, you know, we have 3% as a country, not just Alaska, as a country of the worldwide reserves and about 25% of the use. And so, you know, even if we can increase some increment, we're nowhere close to what we need to be to get off of foreign oil. That's why, and I, I know your audience is probably familiar with this message, that's why what we need is efficiency, we need renewables, um, but we need a transition plan uh, right. at best. Uh, that's what we need to be moving towards. Uh, not not a little stopgap that might increase a quarter of a percent of uh, our domestic production or something like that. Right, it's like we're also going to provide corn to the nation or something. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's not enough considering the consumption levels. The Chukchi and Beaufort Seas right now, uh, very much part of this this whole meme of our in energy independence and you know how we're going to kick the terrorist ass we're going to drill the Chukchi and Beaufort like really is that and, and I'm, I'm hearing this I mean I really am I'm hearing this rhetoric out of Republicans I'm hearing it out of Democrats and I think it's crap on both sides yeah. and and you know I, I've asked the question I asked Senator Mark Begich this I said what are you going to do if there's a spill? I said, where's the nearest Coast Guard base? He said, it's a thousand miles away. And I said, yeah, if you can fly from Kodiak straight up, yeah. but by sea it's like 2,200, almost 2,200 miles to go around. Our nearest Coast Guard base to the Chukchi and Beaufort 
is Kodiak, it's closer to Seattle than it is for them to get to the top of Alaska. Even I mean, if they had, even though if they had all the assets in the world pre-positioned right on the Arctic coast, and there's a catastrophic blowout offshore in the Chukchi, the truth of it is they're not going to get much of it back, and that's the honest truth. Not with the present tools they've got. No, and you know we need to disabuse ourselves of the notion that oil spill response can work anywhere. In the Gulf, they mechanically recovered. This is the biggest oil spill response in human history. They 100%. got back three percent of what was spilled. That is virtually irrelevant. The latest the, word is it's one percent. Yeah, and it may even be less than that. So in the Arctic, with broken sea ice, there, we need to understand that whatever is spilled in the Arctic Ocean will stay there. And back to your other question, you know, the regulatory system for oil and gas in Alaska and the United States is not up to what it needs to be. They say they have a be they require best available technology. They don't. Look at BP's own internal investigation on the North Slope right now, finding 150 sections of pipelines that they rank as an F, as a failure. Now, why didn't the state government and the federal government detect that on their own and then require BP to fix that? They didn't. So there's an, old, an, an utter failure of governance and regulatory oversight. We know we're going to be using oil for the next 10, 20 years. We get that. But we also know we need to transition to the alternatives and the sustainable energy economy. But as long as we're using this stuff, we need to really, really do better at requiring best available technology, minimizing the risk as low as possible, and trying to reduce the amount of carbon emissions from using this stuff. So we know what to do. We just need the political oomph to do it. Yeah, but I mean, we have a governor who was a ConocoPhillips lobbyist. And apparently still is. I have no expectation yeah. that, you know, I mean, look how much money that Vico and people, you know, Bill Allen sitting in jail for it, but they've been buying elections. Now they've got Citizens United uh, through right. the Supreme Court. So, so the campaign finance it's kind has of gone like up. Ca yeah. Campaign finance reform yeah. is out the window. Yeah. And, and so the That's will. That's a huge one. The, yeah. the will to actually do this right yeah. is. In, in huge flux. I don't even know that it exists. Yeah, I, no. I've done the report, um, it was quite a few years ago now, about the state of Alaska's enforcement. And basically what the state did was they'd go after people that had tailpipe emissions and never the big industry. And I've looked at the data since, not as carefully as pulling together the report, but I publicly challenged the state to talk about when they've done enforcement against the industry. We have some rules on paper. 1974. Uh, <laughs> we have, <laughs> that was back a great when you year. Were running. <laughs> but we have some rules on paper that cover the upstream pipelines in the fields, the ones that Rick was, was talking about. Um, they cover those lines and the federal government doesn't, but they just don't do any enforcement. It's like a developing country. You know, you can wave a paper and say, here, we're doing what we should be, but if you don't make sure that those uh, requirements are being carried out, right. it might as well not happen. Well, that. it's, we, you know, we have speed limits, and if we didn't have somebody right. actually pulling people over and giving them tickets, people would drive however fast yeah. they wanted to drive. And right now, we don't have anyone pulling over people giving them tickets to back up the signs. So we got to take a quick break. Well, we're going to come back. The we're mayor's getting rid of the cops and the firemen, so you won't have to worry about that. <laughs> Speed off. Yes, but, yes, but we'll have a party planner. <laughs> you betcha. Uh, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back with more up north in our panel. <laughs>